Do you use social media? Yes. What's your favorite social media platform? Instagram. Snapchat. Instagram. TikTok. I'm gonna go with Instagram. Probably Instagram. Instagram. Probably Snapchat. The Snapchat count? Instagram. TikTok. Uh, probably Instagram. Probably Snapchat. Instagram, it's such a great way to stay connected with all my peers. TikTok. Uh, TikTok. Instagram. Uh, I'd say Instagram. Twitter. Instagram. Instagram. Um, probably Instagram. Probably Twitter. Snapchat. Wait, 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 can I change it? Sure. This guy. What is social media? How does it affect us? Does it help us? Does it hurt us? These questions led me to look into the effects of social media on college students during the pandemic. I think social media is a lot of things, but I think it is really whatever you make of it. Some people use it as a creative outlet. Some people use it to connect with others. Having social media is just like a new way to interact with other people and kind of build new communities. I know I use it to kind of showcase off like, you know, pictures I take with my friends or like things I want to share with like my friends. It's interesting to see like which platforms people choose, but even though it's a way to connect, sometimes I feel like it makes us disconnect even further. In a way it can be like your wildest dream, but it can also kind of be your worst nightmare in some ways. I think there are a lot of like positive and negative components to it. Um, but my favorite part of it is that there's so much that you can do with it. Throughout the uncertainty of the pandemic, one thing became clear. Social media use was at an all-time high. As a college student, I had my own experiences with social media during the pandemic, but I was eager to hear from others. During the pandemic, I definitely think social media had a huge impact on all of us, especially because we were all so far away from each other. Um, being isolated at home for months on end without being able to see anyone, it's definitely, it definitely took an impact on everyone mentally, but also socially. Um, for people like me who are super sociable and are very extroverted, um, it kind of took a huge impact not being able to see people every day. So I kind of took to social media to, in a way, see people and just kind of know what's going on. I would say that I definitely struggle with not seeing people. I'm definitely a social person, so I did turn to social media for that kind of serotonin during the day where usually I have my social interaction. I definitely want to see what the social status of other people was like. Um, are other people going through the same thing as me? I definitely tried to um, connect with other people on a certain level on like what's going on in the world. I think it can be tremendously distracting in both a bad way and a good way. I think it can be like, within the, the pandemic, for instance. Like having TikToks to watch are very lighthearted and it can be fun. But at the same time, if, you're, if people do develop like addictions where, oh my goodness, my Instagram profile, I have to update it, I have to look like I'm doing this, that, and the other thing to match what everybody else is doing, or I have to keep up with these TikTok things, it can take your mind away from maybe doing some other things like, Actually, well, during the pandemic, it was hard to see people, but for instance, like engaging with a movie that maybe has some deeper ideas or a book or, or something like that. So it's a double-edged sword in that sense. Research has shown that having less communication with friends during self-quarantine was a risk factor for declining mental health. With mental health being such a crucial topic of conversation in recent years, I needed to explore further. Associate Director of Counseling Services at Stonehill, Kelly Fitzgerald says, Social media skews our perceptions about what we should be doing, buying, or how we are looking. It can allow people to be more bold, critical, or extreme in the comments without fear of negative in-person consequences or discomfort. It amplifies the FOMO that people are already struggling with. On the other hand, it has allowed for access to resources, support groups, social connections, and sharing of our lives while apart, which does provide value. FOMO, or the fear of missing out, is broadly defined as the feeling that others have more rewarding experiences from which one feels excluded. As a result of FOMO, people feel forced to permanently stay in contact and to continually keep informed about others' activities. I was sent into quarantine senior year um, three times, three or four times, and one of them was the last week of classes. Um, so I missed, like, a, like, for me, it felt like a major milestone 
And there was massive amounts of FOMO because I was going on social media. I was stuck at home in my room, not able to go anywhere. And I'm seeing, you know, all of my social media followers, you know, out at Stonehill, they're going to class, you know, they're, you know, sitting outside and enjoying the weather, you know, they're able to kind of soak up the last moments of senior year. And like, it, it almost felt like an extra like punch into the chest because I felt like I, you know, was living this like twisted reality with, you know, obviously the times being so scary and with like mask mandates and all of that to then get sent into quarantine, like my last week of classes was really difficult. So I think those times when I was kind of in like quarantine themselves, that was probably the lowest that my mental health had probably gotten. I think I definitely experienced FOMO, especially um, on Snapchat. I would have my Snapchat memories come up and I'd be like, oh, on this day, I was doing this with my friends or this with my teammates or I was traveling here to play tennis and all of a sudden I wasn't doing that anymore, especially my seasons in the fall. And I was completely remote during my fall junior year. So I had no season, nothing to do, and I had like four classes to take online. And I would see videos of people just like on the quad, having fun, going out, whatever. And of course, like in Florida, at least I had the liberty of going outside in nice weather, but um, it's different running alone than running with your friends. Yeah, I definitely think I had like FOMO, not like traditional FOMO where I'm staying behind and I see my friends going out, but like life event FOMO, like, oh, I'm not having a normal college experience and I'm definitely missing out. Um, Like I would just think to like my older sister and like the like, I get so like envious and be like, oh, you had a normal four years of college. You got to like go out with your friends every year. Like I turned 21 in the middle of the pandemic. I was like, oh, I can't go out and like party. Like I really wanted to do those things. And so I definitely did have FOMO. One interesting term I found in my research was vague booking, which is defined as social media posts that contain little actual and clear information but are worded in such a way as to solicit attention and concern from readers. Yeah, I definitely think I saw a lot of vague booking during the pandemic. Um, I don't know if there was necessarily an increase because I feel like now knowing what it is, it was definitely happening before. Like, I feel like always people kind of used social media as a place to kind of have a cry for help if they needed it. Um, But yeah, I've definitely seen a lot of it, especially on like stories, like Snapchat stories and um, Instagram stories. Was social media really being used as an escape? As a way of coping with the reality of living in a pandemic? It certainly seemed so. In a study with over 5,000 participants, time spent on mobile gadgets increased significantly from 40% of individuals spending more than three hours per day in 2019 to 71% in 2020. I definitely think that people used social media as an escape during the pandemic. I mean, I used it creatively as an outlet, but also just in general, um, people kind of getting away from just being stuck in their room, stuck in their house, um, and with their family and things like that. People didn't really want to think about coronavirus. It's really scary and it's something that the modern generation has never experienced in their lives. So I think social media was a way to say, hey, let's go back to normal instead of kind of facing reality. Absolutely. Um, I think it was, it's sort of designed for like short attention span. Theater, everything is quick. I mean, everything is the scroll or the, okay, what's the next video? What's the next funny thing? What can I click on? What else has this person posted? What are my friends sharing with me? So I think in that sense, it, it, it does provide an escape, absolutely. And it's almost like, okay, you have a cold, take a cough drop. It makes you feel a little better. It doesn't make the cold go away. It's not gonna make the pandemic go away. You can get some escape from it, but you still need that human connection. So I think it, it offered some comfort, but I don't think it was like a remedy for it. It was found that social comparisons on platforms such as Facebook or Instagram can lead to negative feelings such as jealousy, envy, depression, and anxiety, or to negative perceptions of one's own attractiveness and social competence. It can negatively affect the psychological well-being of users. When looking at Instagram, with it being a forum for visual content, it encourages users to engage in excessive social comparison which can lead to negative outcomes. Furthermore, students who had suspected COVID-19 symptoms were more likely to become more nervous or anxious when they watched news and stories about coronavirus on social media. I think that social media has impacted college students during the pandemic in kind of a negative way. I remember just being around my teammates every single day here 
and then all of a sudden being home for the pandemic and I just kind of felt really ostracized from everything, just like all of a sudden removed from every situation. And I would see like videos or posts of people being like extremely active or productive and I just felt like I wasn't doing enough. And that kind of just made me feel like I wasn't keeping up to par with all the other athletes and kind of just had a negative view of myself during that point in time. I think for a lot of college students, it definitely was a more negative thing because it just got to that point where a lot of, I think a lot of people were kind of spending hours on it and not like taking care of like their mental health. I know I got to that point where I was kind of like, I need to get up and like actually like do something with my life today, even if it's just like going for a walk. Like I can't like spend all my time on TikTok. I need to like do something. I've found that the longer that I stay on social media, like especially like Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, um, I get a lot sadder and my mood decreases a ton. And I think it's just because I'm like in this constant comparison state and I even noticed that too, like in the height of the pandemic where nobody was going anywhere. Like I'm seeing people like make these accounts or like doing these fun crafts or like they're getting outside and I'm like constantly like blaming myself that I should be, you know, I should be going outside and going for more walks. I should be really like focusing on my artwork and like learning how to like draw better, or do more tutorials, like this is the time to do it. So there was almost this pressure like from social media that if I didn't do it, I wasn't like using my time correctly. In recent months, the resurgence of Yikiaks has created a lot of discussion on campus as it has fostered a platform where users can share their thoughts and remain anonymous. This has led to hateful speech and inappropriate comments about people all over campus. I remember Yik Yak was an app that surfaced around my um, junior year of high school. And I remember it being banned for the exact reasons I think it should be banned in college. It's just a, a place where people can be hateful and not have any backlash because it's an anonymous app. And I personally dislike it greatly. Uh, I know a lot of people who have had their full government name dropped on that app and people saying like horrible things about them. It's happened to me and you just, there's nothing you could do about it besides hope that people are smart enough not to believe everything they see. Just because of the anonymous factor, it really is a mind game of who is posting what and is it about me, even if it isn't. Um, and there is a lot of vague booking on that as well. I know I like have like a huge fear that I'm gonna like see my name on it one day. I feel like that's an, actually an example of like an app that has more negative than positive um, like things on it. With the result of our screen times available at the touch of a button, I was curious to know how many people were aware of their screen times. One study said that there was an increase in screen time of students between the ages of 18 and 24 at night, causing the sleep cycle to shift toward the morning. As of this week, my number one most used social media app is TikTok at four hours and nine minutes. This week is three hours and 47 minutes, and that's my daily average. My daily average is like about six hours, which kind of seems a little crazy. Last week's average was five hours and it fluctuated. I think the lowest was three hours and seven minutes and the highest was six hours and 45 minutes. I do have limits set on my TikTok and Instagram to an hour each because I noticed I was using them so much, but the limits don't really work for me because I just hit ignore limit for the day and I just keep going. So my daily average screen time on my phone I think is four hours and five minutes. Apparently my daily average on my screen is five hours and 58 minutes, which is down 16% since last week. It seems that I often ignore the time limit that's given to me and I say 15 more minutes, 15 more minutes. In order to see the full picture, I look to the pros and cons of social media during the pandemic. So as platforms such as TikTok started to arise and become more popular, um, there's a lot of trends on TikTok that people started doing more and more outside of just the normal like dances and stuff like that. But a lot of them at the time revolved around reminiscing in the past and happy memories when life was normal and things like that. And I think mentally that was probably tough for a lot of people to see over and over again. Um, coming out of high school personally, I people were posting about their graduations and all that kind of stuff. And other schools were posting about the activities that they were able to give their seniors that maybe I didn't get or like vice versa. So there was a lot of just like 
longing for those experiences and uh, people who got to travel before like sooner than the rest of the world decided to travel like kind of just things like that it made you feel more trapped as humans we need to communicate with each other so i think seeing each other's pictures on instagram um sharing funny tiktoks with each other that being a form of, of communication that can be very positive it's definitely given me like the opportunity to communicate with friends like when we first were sent home I think, our, I think it was our sophomore year in the spring. Um, that was like kind of difficult because I didn't get to see any of my friends. Like it was so suddenly and we were like getting ready to do a show and it was so many things were just stopped right away. So like being able to use social media to like not feel as alone and isolated was really helpful. Um, and then I think it, it the harm it's done is that um, it has become kind of like a crotch and like I feel like I use it so much more now because of the pandemic because I got so used to it like for me like I would go and like see people who are still kind of like not necessarily following the social distance stuff and like actually like socializing and having fun with people and I was like oh like I kind of missed that like I kind of like got into my head a little like anxious and like upset about it um, and I think I think too like there's just that aspect of missing out on what was going on in the world even before like the pandemic like kind of like I would spend I know I'd spend hours like scrolling through Instagram and like looking at old pictures that I would take or like pictures of like me and my friends and, like oh I miss that a lot and it kind of just make me like a little bit upset because I couldn't do that in that moment. There were a lot of information uh, things that we had to learn about about coronavirus that um, kind of the only way to spread it was through social media and saying here's what you need to know here's what you need to do. Um, I think that really really helped. Um, just kind of reading people's different opinions, health experts, um, maybe just like even your friends and family, what they think about what's going on. Um, but that can also be flipped to the other side in that not everything you see on the internet is true. So I think a lot of things during the pandemic were spread on social media that were probably false or just misinformational. So I think that sharing information had both a positive and negative effect on a lot of people. Reports of clinically significant levels of stress, anxiety, and depression were present at exceedingly higher rates than prior published data on COVID-19 affected populations, which have ranged from 15% to 48% for depression and 6% to 51% for anxiety. When looking at college students, support from parents in the form of being present and engaging in day-to-day -day conversation was shown to be a valuable resource that students can tap into to develop healthy coping mechanisms. Pathways to Peace is just one example of how students were able to find healthy ways of channeling their energy into something new and productive during the pandemic. So I thought like Instagram would be the best platform for me to start like my Pathway to Peace brand just because there's so many people that are on it. I think you get a lot of like my parents are um, baby boomers. So um, my mom has an Instagram account. So you kind of get that niche of the generation. Um, my cousins are millennials, so you get a lot of the millennial generation, and then I'm Gen Z, and it's like almost all of Gen Z is like on Instagram. So I thought it was a really great way to kind of make my brand kind of come to life and really g get into the laps of people that might need it. Two years after the pandemic first began, we are now seeing the bigger picture of the impact that it has had on us, the toll it has taken on our mental health, and the lessons we have learned. Coming into this documentary, I assumed that most of the impact social media had on students during the pandemic was negative. The overuse of social media did encourage self-comparisons and nostalgia, which could decrease the mental health of users, as well as the overload of COVID-related news on all media platforms. During the filming of this documentary, however, I have realized that although it has hurt in many ways, social media has also helped share information and keep people connected in a time where nothing was certain.